Jesus says in Matthew 6, and we're going to skip through uh, uh, this. I'm not going to read every line, obviously. Okay? But be careful not to do your good deeds publicly to be seen by men. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Okay? Whenever you give to the poor and do acts of kindness, don't blow a trumpet and advertise it as the hypocrites do. Now, I'm in the Amplified. In the synagogues and the streets so that they can be honored and recognized and praised by men. I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, they have their reward in full. What is Jesus dealing with here? What he's addressing is a motive, a heart perspective, right? What he is saying is, when you give, and he, uh, uh, let me just go ahead and, and, and give you a spoiler alert here. As, he, as we go down this chapter, he says that about every one of these tenets of the faith we're going to address. He says, when you do it, don't do it like the hypocrite. The hypocrite is somebody who does something just for the sake of, of inviting praise and, and applause, right? Their motive was to be seen by men. Remember, if you do something, so for example, the fasting challenge, we're going to fast corporately and together and we're talking about it, but our motive is not to be seen and applauded by men. Our motive is to come together as a church and to grow deeper into the things of God. So the issue here that Jesus addresses is motive, Okay. Make sure your motive in giving is right, because if you give for any other motive, then you believe in God who sees you in secret. That's why you can give without advertising your giving. You can give. So uh, I have been in, in churches and ministries, and again, I'm not making judgments of any church or ministry if you've been in a place like that and they've done that, but, but I, many years ago, I resolved not to stand up and to walk forward when they said, hey, we just need X number of people to give, X number of people to sow this amount, if you'll just come forward and make that commitment right now, okay? I determined that I might give and sow into that very thing they're asking about. I'm just not going to get up and walk up and tell everybody about it because I want what I do to be secret. Now, people in the church would see it. If you give, I'm going to know whether you gave or not, because at some point, you know, there's reports that you have to manage and all the above. But, but you're not running around advertising your kindness and your good deeds. You're doing it with the motive of, I know God. See, notice what Jesus said. God who sees in secret. He tells us everything that we do, the things which are done in secret will be revealed openly. Do you know that that's true of the world too? He says, what, what they do in secret will be shouted. What they whisper in the secret places of their chambers and their houses will be shouted from the rooftops one day, right? And yet we are believers. So he's not dealing with us here in the area of our sin life because we should be dead to the sin nature. What it says here is that our father who sees every detail of what we do. Have you ever felt like you've been passed over at times and people haven't seen what you did? People didn't recognize your value. They didn't understand. You did some, something kind, something good, something gracious, some stretch and sacrifice. And guess what? Not only did sometimes people didn't acknowledge it, they ended up acting entitled and ungrateful and unthankful. I mean, you'll have people that you do. There seems like sometimes the people you go the farthest for are the ones who appreciate it the, less, the least, right? Okay. And yet, if I get bitter, if I get bent out of shape, if I get upset, if I get disappointed, if I, if I got to go to God and tell them all about that and I'm just, okay, it's because my motive at some point shifted from just trusting in the God who sees me in secret and will give me a perfect reward. And I got into this place where I started to, to you know, they didn't even say thank you for that. They didn't even write me a thank you card. They didn't even acknowledge what, what I did. I mean, that's really rude. Now, is it rude to not do that? Sure, it's rude. Is it polite when somebody gives and is gracious that you acknowledge that? You have a good heart, a good attitude? You're not entitled? Yeah, but that's them, okay? And we're talking about us tonight. When you, because you're generous givers. Why? Because Jesus said give. Jesus said be faithful givers. Givers are people who refuse to stop giving just because somebody didn't appreciate it. I might shift where I'm giving, but I am giving because I'm a giver. It's a principle. Jesus said it is more blessed to do what? Then to what? Now, that's a paradigm shift. Okay? Nothing's more exciting on Christmas Day, right, for a child than to receive. 
receive. What, uh, think about it. When you were a little child, okay, and I got a bunch of them in my house, all right, it is, it's exciting as a parent to watch them get excited about their gifts. In the same way our Heavenly Father feels that way about us, about giving us good gifts. But notice the childlike attitude is, I can't wait to receive. What did I get? Where's my stuff? Okay? Whether we like it or not, the more mature attitude, the grown-up attitude is, now as a father, I sit back and I don't really get much of anything for Christmas comparatively to what I did when I was younger. At one point, it was all about me. Or, you know, like Christmas as a kid, it's like... What about me, right? Now the position is I get to be the one to bless somebody else. And my joy comes from getting to see their faces and the, and the excitement they get. So the point is Jesus says it's more blessed to be in that position than to be in the receiving position. If I'm constantly a receiver and not a giver, then I will always be at the, the um, limitation of people who give to me. I will always be restricted in my increase in my growth by whether somebody gave to me or they didn't give to me. When I'm a giver, I I, I move out of the realm of being responsible or dependent on people and I move into the economy of heaven for my life. So the only way to transition, now specifically, we're going to talk about good deeds in a second, but specifically we're talking money here, okay? When I give money to the kingdom, when I do acts of charity, when I give to the poor, we, we funded an orphanage this uh, 2022 because of your generous giving that, that has over 60 plus children in it right now in the Philippines, which is one of the most highly trafficked sex traffic areas for children in the world. Okay. So, so we don't have an orphan program here today. Long term, that would be a goal. That'd be something we're praying. But so we made sure we gave into orphans. We helped fund widows in India, in Vishakapatnam. And I know I didn't say that right, Marty. Okay. But we we did, we funded, I never do say it right. Okay. One of the after I come back from there, I'll probably be saying it right. I'll be drinking tea. I'll be doing all this thing. I'll have my Indian shirt on. Okay. I'll be even talking like this. Okay. So we help. We help sow to widows there. Why? Because God wants, he cares about the widow. He cares about the orphan. He cares about the poor. Okay. Now, the, the point is, is when we determine to get in the stream of being a giver, we're in the stream closest to the Lord Jesus. When I'm out here and I'm receiving, remember, even the Lord washed, he gave, he washed feet. Yes. He washed feet. Do you know he washed feet going into his crucifixion? He could have been doing a lot of stuff. He washed feet. He was giving, right? He gives us the principle for success, for wealth, for prosperity in the area of our finances, and that is to be a giver. When I give, I break the back of a poverty mentality. See, you can have money and still have a poverty mentality. Uh, uh, Dr. Malone said this to me many years ago, because I said, define poverty mentality for me uh, according to what the way you view it. And uh, he gave me a really cool thing. What he said is a poverty mentality, okay, uh, as it relates to God and doing the things of God is anytime God tells you to do something and the first thing you say is, well, how am I going to pay for that? Where am I going to get the money for that? Okay. I tell Leslie, even though we don't have millions of dollars flowing in today from the ministry, we will one day. And I'm going to think and act like we do, even though we don't. Because I don't want to limit my thought process to only what I have, what I can see, what's tangible, because I know that I'm a sower and I'm a giver. And Paul said a man's harvest in life depends entirely on what he sows. So we're constantly putting seed in the ground before the Lord God Almighty, knowing that the law of seed time and harvest is the harvest multiplies. So what I have is my harvest if I keep it. It's my seed if I sow it, and when I sow it, it multiplies every time. That's the law of the seed. He gives bread to eaters, seed to sowers. So do you know the word of God says that the righteous will not be forsaken or their seed begging for bread? So what does that mean? That means God will make sure, do you know he said even the sparrows, they don't have to sow or toil or labor? And he said, how much more worth are you to me than the sparrows of the, of the earth flying around? So do you know they don't sow? Sparrows don't sow. And God provides for them. So he gives them their bread. 
But have you ever seen a sparrow living in abundance? Okay, living in the overflow? Why? They don't sow. God gives us the opportunity to say later, he says, I give bread to eaters and seed I give to sowers. So you got to discern what's your bread and what's your seed. Now, he goes on to say, when you do acts of kindness. So giving, becoming a radical giver in 2023 is not just about giving your money. It's about sowing honor where honor isn't due. It's choosing to be a David instead of a Saul. I made up my mind many years ago, I'm going to be a person of honor. I'm going to sow honor. Even when honor, you didn't even treat me right, and I'm going to sow honor. You know why? Because I'm trusting God. He's going to reward me for the way I sow honor. He's going to honor me. I'm going to receive honor. Remember what Jesus said. Don't go position yourself in a place of honor. Go sit in the back. Trust him, and in due time, he'll, he'll move you forward. Right? If I'm trusting God who sees, see, that's the hard part of human nature. Believing God sees me in secret. When nobody else sees me, what I'm doing, you either believe, you get convinced that he sees everything I'm doing in secret, and he promises to, where, where will he reward me? In the open. So see, I don't even, I don't, the, he, what he said is, if I do it in front of people and advertise it with the wrong motive, that's my reward. Right? The praise of people is my reward. But if I do something and I'm faithful, so forgiveness. The Bible says if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven. So I got to give forgiveness even when it's not due. Right? Not because I feel like it. It's not about our feelings. Do you know, I was saying this to Leslie the other day. We were having a conversation about uh, something she was sharing with me from, from a, a, a lady she was mentoring and counseling. And um, what I said is, isn't it fascinating how God never makes any concessions for our feelings in the word of God as it relates to obeying his word. You won't find one concession. God says, well, if you feel this way on this day, eh, you don't have to do it. Does God care about our feelings? Does he, does he sympathize with our weaknesses? Absolutely. At the end of the day, is how we feel a justification for disobedience in the word? No. So I don't feel like forgiving that person. Are you kidding me? I have to ask God for the grace, for the heart to do it, and I make an effort to do it. It's like love. You don't always feel in love like you love every five seconds. There's sometimes you don't feel very loving in that moment. I have to choose to discipline myself to act loving anyway, right? So giving, giving is a principle, doing good deeds, doing kind things. So go out of your way, find ways each day, each week that you can become a radical giver in your life. Find ways that you can bless people, that you, you know, praying is giving. When I go pray for somebody and say, can I pray for you? Oh, you, you have that, can I pray for you? I'm, I'm giving, I'm doing acts of kindness. What's more kind than offering your prayers? You're not even giving of your substance. You're giving of the substance of the finished work of Christ. I'm not losing anything here. If anything, I am sharing what I have. Freely, I have been given. Uh, freely, I have to give. Or freely, I've received. Freely, I have to give, right? Okay? So make sure that this year, these are three things now that you can do that will guarantee your, you get increase, that you get a reward. Do you know the word reward means increase in essence? You know, Psalms, Psalms uh, 103 says, forget not the Lord and all his benefits. And then it goes on to list six or seven benefits that we get from serving the Lord. So I like to say the Lord has a greater benefit package than any employer we've ever had, including anything you can fathom for your employees. Guess what? God has a greater benefit package for us than anywhere you go. And I'll tell you on an executive level in the executive world, a benefit package made a difference as to whether I was signing with this business or this business. If I was going to come in and be a, a, a CSO here or over there, had everything to do with what kind of benefits do they have? What kind of package can they offer me? What kind of dividends can this pay long term? That has everything to do with whether you go to one job or another, correct? Okay. So God says, imagine people who are his children that go around in life and never reap the benefits that he has for them. Because number one, they never ever cash their check by faith that he is a God who loves to reward them in the areas of their life. Number two, Jesus said this, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray. But when you pray, go into your most private room, 
Close the door and pray to your father who's in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. We, we serve a God who loves to reward us. I hope you're getting that through this text. We miss it because we make the emphasis on the prayer or the giving, and, and that is part of what, what brings the reward. But what you should be focusing on is the reward. If you think in terms of what's in your hand as your reward, you'll never let it go. If you think in terms of what's in your hand as when you give it, he gives you greater reward, then all of a sudden giving becomes easy. It's the same thing with prayer. See, prayer, if, he, if you go and pray in secret, remember I told you, uh, um, um, message five of the open doors, there's only two doors you're responsible to open and to shut, one each. You are not responsible. Take the weight and the burden off of your life of getting every door open that God wants you to have open. The Bible says Jesus Christ will open the doors over your life that no one can shut. He will shut doors that no one can open. You are responsible for opening and shutting, okay, one door, okay? Now, the door that he tells you you're responsible to shut is the door to the secret place, the door to your prayer closet. And I'm being metaphorical here. He is too. It might be a different place for you. It might be as you're walking, you know, uh, taking a morning walk. It might be literally you go into a prayer closet. Like, did y'all see uh, the war room? Or the, I, th I think that's the movie about prayer. And she goes into her prayer closet, that lady, and she's got all her stuff. That's her prayer closet. But the door metaphorically is close it. In other words, you're sealing yourself off from every other activity of your life. And you're giving God time in focused prayer. I told you Isaiah 64, 4, they who wait on the Lord, okay, when you wait on God, he will do the work over your life. No, I has seen nor ear heard a God like you who works on behalf of those who wait for you. So in other words, the paradigm shift is, see, for my boss, I have to work for him. If I don't work for him and then labor hard enough, I'll get let go and get fired. We live kind of in a performance-based society, okay? You have to perform for other people and produce a product or they don't need you. What God says is the paradigm shift is when you pray, I don't need you to do anything. I just need you to come and be with me, wait on me, press into me, worship me, fellowship with me, listen to my voice, and then I will go and do the work on your behalf. Hallelujah. Isaiah 64.4. So write that down. Make sure you have it up there, meaning uh, make sure you write it down, Okay. So I, God, your boss, imagine your boss, the CEO, the president, the ruler, the king of the universe saying to you, if you will just spend time with me, here's what I'll promise you. I will come out of that room with you and I will go ahead of you and make everything work out in your life. I will go do what you can't do. That's the principle of open doors is going, God, okay, I've been missing it this whole time. I've been striving. See, Jesus went to the cross so you wouldn't have to strive. He went to the cross. Remember, part of the curse was the labor and toil and sweat of the brow. That was the curse. Okay? Jesus went to the cross and, and destroyed the curse over my life. So now I don't get it from labor, sweat, toil, and striving in my flesh. I get it from trusting and surrender to a God who said he would do on my behalf what I couldn't do if only I would put my confidence and my trust and my time. If I'd sow my time into him, then he would make sure that he did the work. Does that mean I don't go work hard when I leave my prayer closet? Does that mean I don't go work and, and have good work ethic? And, and No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is most people, I'll give you an example. She might be watching tonight, Zorea. Zorea uh, used to attend faithfully, and then her and her husband moved over an hour plus away. She got saved right here in this ministry. Okay? She was a co-worker uh, of mine and one of my employees at one point, and um, I was sharing the gospel with her on a consistent basis back when I was in the workforce. And she got saved, and of course, she started coming as a member of our church. Now, I had a word for her one time. I saw, I was down here praying, and the Lord gave me a word for her. She was looking for a job at the time, and I gave her a number. And that number was 15, 20 grand more than she had ever earned in her life. And part of what I said is, what I believe the Lord is showing me is God does not want to give you, Zorea, what you, what you deserve. 
what your resume says you could have, what your experience says he has, what, 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 you, what you have earned. Because she, she said, I've never earned that in my life. And what I said to her is this. I said, God wants to show you that he's good and wants to give you greater than what you could earn or strive for or prove through experience because his favor is worth more than a thousand days of your labor. So ultimately, you got to begin to believe God. When you go to God in prayer, begin to believe God to give you everything that Jesus Christ has earned over your life. Everything that Jesus Christ has purchased for your life. Not everything that I've earned. Not everything I've done by experience or can prove. Go before God and say, God, I'm trusting you when I walk out of here because I'm giving you my time that you're going to get for me everything the Messiah has purchased in the finished work. That's what grace is. That's what favor is. Favor is unmerited. So when I pray, I'm going under the principle of recognizing, okay, that there is no greater communion I can have, no greater thing I can sow my time into. Back to give. Give your time in prayer. And God who sees you doing prayer in secret, does that mean you don't come in here and corporately pray? No. Does that mean we don't get on a prayer call? By the way, I want to encourage you guys, prayer calls are happening on Zoom on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, right? We see miracles and all kind of neat things break out. And most of the engine that drives anything we're doing is coming out of those meetings anyway. So we want to encourage you. You don't have to be a, a, a member. Just jump on, okay? Invite your friends and your family. Just let us know they're coming because otherwise I've learned to, like, sometimes we'll get people who are intentionally just trying to, right, be difficult because they've come from online somewhere, all right? We had a them and a they and some other stuff here recently. And we shared the gospel with them, didn't we? Yeah, we shared Christ with them, okay? But then we had to block them because of some of the stuff they were saying to do. So anyway, my point is, join us on that prayer call, okay? But prayer, we still do corporate prayer. But let me say this to you. If the only time you pray is on a Sunday morning, you're missing the whole point of being in, in fellowship with the Lord. If the only time you pray is on a Saturday night, you're missing it. If the only time you worship, if worship to you is Saturday night or Sunday morning, you're not, you're not being a disciple, right? You're being a convert, you're, you're converted, but you're not a disciple, Disciples are mature. They mature past the place of, I just had an experience once, but I'm living a life of fellowship and walking with the Lord. Okay? So number three, fasting. Okay? And by the way, let me say this about prayer. I I put this on our social media pages. Prayer, write this down. Prayer brings us into alignment with the will of heaven over our lives. So let let me explain that to you. Okay? We look at prayer like I am praying so that God can come and do what I want him to do in my life. What prayer really is about is saying, God, I'm coming to alignment with what you want to do over my life. The only way you come into agreement with what God is doing in the earth. He said, when you pray, pray this way. And he said, pray, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, what we're really doing is saying, God, I am yielding and coming into agreement with your will over my life. I want for you everything you have for me, everything you've purchased for me. So I'm not saying, God, I need you to get on board with my plans, okay, because that's what we like to do. What what we're saying when we pray is we're coming into alignment. Alignment is like when you get your tires worked on, you get new tires, and they got to put alignment in the way that they roll so they're smooth. So my life, when I'm not praying, my life is somehow out of alignment with God's will. So if God's will is coming down in this area. When I'm not in prayer on a consistent basis, I'm over here in my thought process and my attitude and my actions in my life. When, I, when I'm praying consistently, I'm bringing myself into alignment with, with God, his will being done in earth and my life as it is in heaven. Right? Okay. Number three, fasting. When you fast. He said, when you fast, notice when you give, when you pray, when you fast. He didn't say if. If you give, if you pray, if you fast. He said when you do these things. In other words, these are tenets of the faith. These are disciplines that he's called us to do. He talks about fasting as a third as often as he talks about prayer. So you should look at fasting in that regard. Most people, if they do fast, they fast in some corporate church thing on January, right? And that's about it. They don't ever consider it. Here's what I want to encourage you. Make fasting a part of your lifestyle, okay? 
Fasting, make it a part of your lifestyle. Do it throughout. Now, the early church, the New Testament church, used to fast two days a week. Okay? From evening to evening. That's how it worked in the Hebrew uh, uh, calendar. Okay? Now, why is that? Because it keeps you sharp. Spiritually speaking. So let me, let me say this. Write this down. Fasting causes us to experience the glories of heaven. So when I participate in fasting, what I'm doing is I'm participating in the crucifixion of the Lord and his suffering so that I can be a partaker of his glory. The, the thing that stands between you, the number one thing that stands between you and, and everything God has for you is you. Even more than the devil, remember the devil was a, is a defeated foe. Is he loose on the earth? Absolutely. Can he bring all kind of stuff against me? Absolutely. But does he have victory over my life through the blood? Okay. Does he have the final say over my destiny? No. Okay. The, the number one person that can stop or block God's perfect will in your life is us. Okay. Fasting removes you. It removes your flesh. Remember what Jesus said. And I won't go there for time's sake. Jesus said, they came to him. By the way, they were a, were a reproach, in essence, to the name of Christ because they couldn't cast out this demon, okay, in this situation. We don't even cast out demons, much less think it's a reproach to, to not be able to, right? Meaning most of the church in America doesn't even consider casting out demons as part of the job description, right? Adam sent me, I'm going to post this on social media. Adam sent me this today, and it's a picture of, I think it's Anthony Hopkins uh, in some movie, and he's holding up a cross, like, and he looks like a priest, like a Catholic priest, and it says, my New Year's resolution, exercise more, but it's exercise the demons, right, instead of, so that was funny. I'm going to post it later. Okay, I told y'all, this is my year. Did y'all see the, the, the new wolf moon, right? The new wolf moon. We just had a new wolf moon, so I was teasing. This is my year, yeah, right? Okay. All right, so... Fasting, though, watch. Fasting, and we're getting ready to close, but I want, you to, I want you to hear this. This is deep stuff. If you get this stuff and you practice this stuff, this isn't my words. I'm not trying to be original. I'm not trying to be creative. I'm trying to teach you the ancient paths. That's what Jeremiah said. Let's follow the ancient path. It's already been laid out. Okay? Preachers that get up here and try to be original and creative and tell you something you never heard are missing the point. I should be a redundant and parroting what's in this word over and over again, because that's really the true wisdom and the true source of life, the living word of God. So when I fast tomorrow, by the way, come back just because you came on Saturday, come back for double tomorrow, because I'm going to teach you the practical as we get ready to go into the fasting challenge. I'm going to teach you the physical, practical benefits of fasting and the spiritual benefits. We're specifically going to address the benefits spiritually of fasting. We're going to address the physical benefits of fasting. Okay, and I'm going to talk to you from two perspectives, both the spiritual and the medical side. Okay, fasting is the number one greatest thing you could ever do for the healing of your bodies. Jesus was not going to ask you to do something that hurts you or destroyed you. I know the plans I think towards you say the Lord to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. So God never asks us to do anything that's detrimental to us. He might ask us to do something that's detrimental to the flesh nature. And what you'll find as you're fasting is the flesh nature has a greater grip on us than we realize, right? And when we fast, we are, we are saying, I am giving up the grip that you, my flesh, has on my life. Paul said, when I do something that I, I know I shouldn't do, it's not even I who do it anymore. Go, go read Romans. Paul literally says it's the flesh nature in me. It's, he disassociates the flesh nature from who he really is. It's fascinating. Most people never saw it. I, I was recently reading it, and it just stood out in such an incredible way in a time of prayer with the Lord. And, and I, God highlighted the fact that literally me, the me that I am, is not even the, the, the guy who does things that I shouldn't do or don't like what I do, because that's the old nature. But that's the old nature rising up in me and attempting to have a victory that day because I didn't crucify my flesh. I got to continue to crucify. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Fasting. Fasting crucifies the flesh so that we can be in tune with the spirit. You will hear more clearly than you've ever heard in your life 
the voice of the Lord. Prophetic, it sharpens your prophetic gifts. It sharpens your dream life. It sharpens everything spiritually. And not necessarily when you start out on the first day. But it will, it will sharpen the anointing. And it's like, a, like a, the wetting of a blade of your spiritual life when you fast. Jesus said, when you fast, I will reward you. And don't do it to be noticed. Again, we're challenging each other corporately here, right? But we're not running around and saying, look at us. It's not our heart motive. I'm not fasting for my health, right? I'm not fasting to lose weight. All those motives are secondary and they're benefits and they're positive things. And we'll talk about those, those physical side. But remember, the whole purpose is so that we can carry and understand and realize the glory. Do you know that you don't get new glory what you do is you get yourself out of the way so you can receive the glory that God already has and he purchased for your life. Do you know Christ is not going to come back down from heaven and get on a cross for us? He finished 2,000 years ago everything that he had for us. Everything he purchased for us was done and complete. He sat down. He's not getting back up for us. He's not getting back up for our generation. What he's saying is, if you will fast, you remove yourself, your unbelief. The greatest enemy I have is unbelief. And what Jesus said when he rebuked them for, for, for in essence, being a reproach to the name of Christ for not being able to cast out this demon, right? What Jesus said, they said, Master, Lord, tell us why, Rabbi, why, why couldn't we cast this thing out? And here's what he said. I love his response because there's some, we can do something about his response. What he said was... It's because of your unbelief. He did not say it's because you don't have enough authority. He didn't say because you don't have my authority. Remember, he'd already given his authority. You carry the authority of Jesus Christ to command, to, to curse a thing that God would curse, meaning a sickness, a disease, to command a demon to go, whatever it is. In your life, you carry the authority to do it. The problem is we have unbelief in our heart. And fasting, like nothing else, helps deal with unbelief. Jesus said, this type comes not out but by prayer and fasting. 